Welcome to Chapter 13. We're going to be talking about the juvenile court process, including pretrial, trial, and sentencing. <clears throat> so let's talk about the juvenile court and its jurisdiction. So uh, modern juvenile delinquency cases are handled as part of a criminal trial uh, court jurisdiction or within the probate court. In most jurisdictions, they're treated in the structure of family court or an independent juvenile court. The independent juvenile court is a specialized court for children. It's, des it's designed to promote rehabilitation of the youth. And juvenile court is concerned with acting in the best interest of the child and the best interest of public protection. So in 2011, almost 1.236 million delinquency cases were referred to juvenile court. This is a 34% decrease from the peak year of 1997. In 2011, 70% of delinquency cases involved a male and 19% involved a female. 33% of the juvenile court population was made up of African American youth, although African American youth make up only 16% of the general population. So let's talk about the actors in the juvenile courtroom. The defense attorney represents the child in the juvenile court and plays an active and important role in all stages of the hearing or proceedings. Um, they have to be provided, indigent youths have to be provided um, counsel, especially in the case of possibility of incarceration. <clears throat> The guardian and minor, the GAL, may be appointed by the court. Uh, they fulfill many roles, ranging from legal advocates to concerned individuals, working with parents, and the human service professionals. Court-appointed special advocates, the CASA program, are volunteers, and they advise the court about child placement. <clears throat> Public Defender Services for Children um, those, of course, are the attorneys that work in um, a public agency or have a contractual agreement as a defense counsel to these juveniles. A juvenile prosecutor is a um, attorney who represents the interests of the state and brings the case against the juvenile. And then the juvenile court judge uh, is the central character in the court. Their responsibilities have become really more extensive and complex in recent years. The judge, juvenile court judge, has extensive influence over other agencies of the court, probation, the court clerk, the law enforcement officers, and of course the office of the juvenile prosecutor. So according to this philosophy of parents patrie, uh, judges must ensure that the necessary community resources are available so that children and families can receive the proper care and help. It's really a big part of juvenile court. So let's talk about the process that happens when a juvenile is brought into juvenile court. Um, many decisions are made during the pretrial process and the juvenile trial and disposition. Some of the things that can be made are whether to, um, if they're gonna treat the case as a formal case, there has to be a decision made to either release the child or detain them into the temporary care of the state. Um, we know that detaining a child, detention, incarceration can be very traumatic to a child. So um, facilities are prison liked with locked doors and barred windows. So many experts advocate that detention be limited to alleged offenders who require secure custody for the protection of themselves and others. Here we go. Yes. So when we're talking about um, national detention trends, we know that juveniles are still being detained in just one out of every five delinquency cases, 
with some variation across the major offense categories. The typical delinquent detainee is a male over 16 years of age and charged with a violent crime. So there's some new approaches to detention. Um, efforts have been ongoing to improve the process and the conditions of detention. Um, experts maintain that detention facilities should provide youth with education, visitation, private communications, counseling, medical and health care, anything that they might possibly, possibly need. <clears throat> but when we're making a decision as to whether we're going to detain or not detain, we might be looking at their high risk. Their risk. Are they highly uh, likely to run? Um, have they been, you know, runaways for quite some time? That's going to be something that um, they're going to want to know as when they're making the, the decision. There are many uh, alternatives to secure detention, maybe home and electronic monitoring or in-home detention. Um, there's day center electronic monitoring, all sorts of different options that might be used. But the biggest thing is that we know that there are some laws and guidelines. In 1989, the Juvenile Justice and Delinquency Prevention Act was amended, and basically it required states to remove all juveniles from adult jails and lockups. And federal guidelines require that juveniles in state custody are separated from adult offenders, or the state could actually lose their federal juvenile justice funds. So the OJJDP has made this deinstitutionalization of status offenders a cornerstone of its policy. And what we're looking at is the fact that status offenders, juveniles that commit crimes that are not illegal for adults, like drinking alcohol, uh, doing marijuana, maybe skipping school, truancy, those different things that we don't need to be locking up status offenders with criminal offenders. There is a definite difference in these kids and are we breeding more uh, juvenile delinquents? <clears throat> so what happens when we're talking about the process of intake and how this works when a juvenile is actually arrested. Um, so first the juveniles have to be, um, the cases have to be screened and does juvenile court need to become involved is a huge piece of that. And some of the actions that might happen with that is they might just say, well, we're not, we don't believe that, you know, that this is a crime or that this has happened, so we're going to send the youth home and there's going to not be any action on that. Um, there can also be diversions. Um, so we divert kids out of uh, the court system and then into a, uh, a diversion program. Um, and I was blessed to work in a diversion program um, right out of college, and, and I really did learn so much in that program. Um, of course, you know, a petition uh, to, to juvenile court um, so that, that they would be seen. And then, of course, um, sometimes detention is what needs to happen. So that would happen at that point. Um, and so when we have these consistent processes, um, it can actually allow for the use of these consent decrees without there being formal adjudication. And adjudication is like um, the juvenile court's word for sentence. When they are convicted, they're adjudicated of a crime. So some of the problems that sometimes happen with um, intake is that it can um, lack consistency. There can be some legal issues um, over, you know, the right to counsel, whether they're protected from self-incrimination. Um, so it can definitely take a lot of work to get those things to all happen right. So we do see plea bargains in juvenile court, 
And this permits a defendant to plead guilty to a less serious charge in exchange for an agreement by the prosecutor to recommend a reduced sentence to the court. There's a long debate over the appropriateness of plea bargaining in juvenile justice. It's less common in juvenile courts than in adult courts. However, it is really uh, entrenched in the juvenile process. Sometimes we are required to have transfer hearings. And this is when a juvenile is transferred from juvenile court to adult criminal court. Uh, this can often kind of maybe called maybe a waiver or a bind over or even a removal. And numbers of youth that are transferred to adult court has declined since their peak in 1994. Um, waiver procedures occur in one of three ways. They uh, can have concurrent jurisdiction in both juvenile and adult court. Um, statutory exclusion policies can be based on what the statute says for certain crimes that juveniles must be waived. And then judicial waiver, um, and a judicial waiver would come directly from the judge. Due process has to be used, and so the standards for transfers are set by state statutes. Um, some will allow for use to be transferred if they're between the ages of 14 and 17. Um, and other states might just restrict waiver proceedings to mature juveniles and specify particular offenses that are eligible for waiver. A few states allow transfer of any child, really, regardless of their age, which I'm not real sure I'm keen on. So there are some um, case law that has gone into effect that have um, changed the way that we look at these things. Um, in Kent v. U.S. 1966, it said the states had to provide this transfer hearing, couldn't just be decided, that there must be sufficient notice given to the family and the defense attorney. Also said that the child has the right to counsel and there must be a statement of reason for the court order regarding transfer. Why does the state want transfer? So we do have other, some other case law as well, Reed v. Jones, and this pretty much uh, prohibited trying an, a child in adult court when there has been a prior adjudicated, adjudic, adjudicatory uh, juvenile proceedings. Uh, double jeopardy falls into into this category. Probable cause may exist at a transfer hearing, and since the same evidence is often used in both the transfer hearing and the subsequent trial, a different judge is often required. So you have to have a different judge um, in these cases to make sure that all evidence is being heard and seen, and there is no deception from the judicial bench. So should they be transferred to adult court? I mean, I think this is an, an important question. Um, there are pros and cons. Um, most young kids are not going to be competent to serve trial as an adult would. Um, and there can be some def very definite um, problems, um, long-term harms of, of trying a child as an adult. And um, them, you know, really being incarcerated, um, possibly. Here are some pros. It kind of coincides with the get tough policy, which we're not sure really works. Um, and the waivers can be really the superior method to other methods for handling the most serious of juvenile offenders. And it's continued use, um, though really starts to have some issues with how that's going to affect the child at um, a later state in time. There can be long-term benefits, of course. So here is um, a graphic. Just take a minute and look at this. It talks about uh, delinquency cases and the numbers and the years and which ones were waived to criminal court. So we're going to pause here and we'll come back and talk about the juvenile court trial.